So far in our Meet a Musician series, we've heard from musicians you regularly see on stage playing instruments. But it takes more than instruments to put on a concert. And among our 80 members at the Kansas City Symphony, there are two whose instruments these days look more like pencil and paper, despite both being trained and talented clarinet players. I'm talking, of course, about our music librarians, Elena lentz Talley and Fabrice Curtis. In a way, an orchestra is sort of like a sonic museum. The art pieces are notated on paper rather than being drawn, painted, or sculpted. These works of art are then brought to life by the performers in new and different ways at each performance. But that original art, the music notation, is forever preserved in libraries and curated by our music librarians. Ever wonder how all the violinists know whether to go up bow or down bow together? Or how we actually get the sheet music from its original source? The answer to these and more lies in our music librarians. So while you might not get to see them getting a solo bow for their work, the work our librarians do is absolutely critical to a performance's success. So join me today as we meet one of our fantastic music librarians, Fabrice Curtis. Curtis. I'm a music librarian with the Kansas City Symphony, and I've been in the orchestra since 2012, so I just finished my eighth season. Well, Fabrice, thank you so much for joining us on this. Can you start off by telling us where you grew up and what your earliest musical memories are? Yeah, sure. My, um, my mom is German, and my dad is, was in the military, so we moved around quite a bit. I was actually born in Frankfurt, Germany, and then uh, moved to Fort Knox, Kentucky. Uh, was there for a few years, then moved back to Kitzingen, Germany uh, for my seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, and then back to Ratcliffe, Kentucky uh, to finish up high school. So I started music in band. Uh, I played clarinet uh, in sixth grade. My mom actually had a pretty big part in what instrument I ended up playing. Uh, she didn't want me to play a brass instrument. She thought it was too loud. And so that woodwinds only. The saxophone was just too expensive and uh, flute she thought was a little too girly, so that left the clarinet, and that's how I ended up playing the clarinet. So how do you feel like that musical study transformed over time into you becoming an orchestral music librarian? So yeah, I started off playing clarinet in band and um, then went to the University of Kentucky to uh, study music education. After that, I wanted to continue my music studies, so I went to, the, to Florida State and uh, studied music theory there. And as I was finishing up my studies there and thinking, what would I be doing next? I knew that I would be moving to Kansas City because my partner, uh, David Sullivan, who plays horn in the orchestra, he had won a job there in 2009. And he actually brought to my attention that there was an opening in the symphony for a music librarian and thought it would be something I'd be interested and good at. And actually I knew nothing about being a music librarian when he brought this to my attention. So I was like, uh, I did as much as I could to uh, learn all the different aspects of being a uh, performance librarian. I um, volunteered with the Tallahassee uh, Symphony with their librarian and just studied as much as I could. Took the audition here and it proved to be successful. Well, that segues into my next question. Through these videos, one thing I've wanted to share with our audience is some inside information into the audition world. Uh, auditioning for a music librarian position is far different than any other orchestra audition. Without giving, any, giving away any of your secrets, uh, talk to us a little bit about what an orchestra audition looks like for a library position and maybe tell us what you remember about your audition. Yeah, so I think um, most orchestra librarian auditions have a few different elements. There's usually some sort of test that tests your knowledge of the orchestral repertoire, of uh, music terminology. Um, then there's usually some practical aspects such as uh, bowing uh, string parts or um, 
doing some transpositions and submitting a sample of your hand manuscript. And there's usually a interview component just where uh, the audition committee will actually interview you face to face. Uh, a typical question is some sort of a scenario of, you know, what would you do in this scenario? Say these things happen to you 10 minutes before a concert. How would you prioritize that? And then my audition here, I remember there were maybe 40 or 50 uh, applicants. So I went in there, like I said, not really thinking I had much of a chance, you know, I, you know and so I went in, took the test, uh, did well. Uh, I think the next round they had um, six people and uh, that was, I guess, the more practical round where we had to uh, bind some music, make a part from some loose sheets of paper and put music in folders and then um, ask some practical sort of questions. And then it was narrowed down to three. Uh, and that was the, the interview with, uh, with Michael Stern and the rest of the committee. Yeah, it was a great day. You know, it ended up being a big old question, a big open question mark. And, you know, it ended up with me having a job and uh, being in the same orchestra with my partner. And yeah, it was a really good day. You mentioned a word in that explanation of uh, transposition. I was wondering if you could describe a little bit about what transposition means. Yeah, so um, many instruments in the orchestra, the part that they read is uh, a different in a different key than what the um, pitch is sounding on their instruments. So um, if you are moving that part from uh, one instrument to another that may have a different transposition, then you have to change how it is uh, written. And, you know, I actually have uh, a long history with transposition just from teaching it as a music theory grad student. And it was always such a big um, mental hurdle for the, the vocalists in particular. They, it was just such a difficult concept within the graph. And um, yeah, I remember having to really break it down. And uh, it can be a tricky concept for people, but once you do it a lot, um, you get used to it, which horn players would know. <laughs> Maybe it's because you and I share the same birthday, Fabrice, uh, which is also pretty exciting. But we also share an enjoyment and an interest in learning about a variety of different things. I know you have many, but can you talk to us some about your non-musical interests? Yeah, sure. Um, one of them is origami. I like to uh, fold things from paper. Uh, I started when I was about 12 and have kept doing it ever since. A lot of people, when I say origami, they just think, you know, cranes and like flowers, but I like to do more involved things like insects and uh, something called tessellation origami, which is like a repeated pattern over and over on a piece of paper. Um, other things, uh, houseplants, there aren't any in behind me, but I have probably over a hundred houseplants. So right now they're all on my front porch enjoying the nice summer weather. Tropical fish, I at one point had five different aquariums, but I've, I've downsized now to just one, simplified my life. And so I have just one, uh, one aquarium with some community tropical fish. Oh, and I'm, I'm kind of known in the orchestra as the bug guy. I actually minored in entomology at the University of Kentucky, uh, worked in some, some labs there over the summer. So i uh, got quite a bit of knowledge in that arena. So I get lots of pictures of what bug is this or, or you know, any sort of bug questions. Uh, well, Fabrice, you are famed, I know, among your musician colleagues for your Halloween costumes. Tell us about some of your favorite costumes from the past and have you given any thought to this year's? Uh, not yet. And, and, you know, it would be a secret. I always keep it beforehand. So no one knows. It's always a surprise until the, the party. But, um, my favorite costume, I have two favorites. One was um, from the movie Beetlejuice, uh, where me and my partner, David, we dressed as Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin, but we dressed as their characters when uh, they stretch their faces around so they can really scare the, um, the people in the house. Uh, so I, I was Gina Davis with the mouth open and the, the eyes in the mouth. Um, and then another one of my favorites is from the movie, The Fifth Element, where um, I was Diva Lava Laguna, the, the blue opera singer alien. Um, yeah, it was a really fun costume to put together. 
for me, half the fun or most of the fun is actually creating the costumes. I usually like to um, build them myself. Uh, you know, costumes like that you can't really buy. So that's that's a lot of the fun of, of Halloween for me. Well, there's been an abundance of bad news in the world recently. Hoping you can share some good things that have happened to you during this lockdown era. Yeah, so in the in the beginning, in, in late March and April, uh, I was actually volunteering with the Heartland Tree Alliance, uh, which plants trees around uh, the KC metro area. So um, did, uh, did some of that, which was really enjoyable. And then um, also I've been trying to go to a lot of the different uh, parks around town, the different uh, nature trails. Um, I'm actually trying to get all of the Kansas City wildlands in over the summer. So there are these wildlands, which are um, remnant, undisturbed areas around Kansas City uh, that are different uh, landscapes, like glades or prairies. Uh, so, so far I've, I've been to quite a few. My favorite has been the Hidden Valley nature area. And I think the next one I want to go to is Agro Prairie, which is down south. I think it's in Shawnee Mission Park. So that's next on my list. Since they are these protected areas, they have people that are um, going through and getting rid of any invasive um, plant life and really trying to bring back those areas to their, their natural state. I've also been doing some gardening. Um, I have quite a big garden and uh, I focus mostly on native plants. So uh, since those are best for the butterflies and the pollinators, so uh, I've been, been doing a lot of that since I've had a little bit more time at home. Well, we do a lot of concerts, as you know, and a lot of the ones that you end up preparing the music for are on a very shortened rehearsal time period. Uh, what's one concert that you've had to prepare for here that you will never forget? And what was it about that program that made it so unforgettable? The first thing that comes to mind when you ask that question are our programs where maybe the music is not in the best state. So sometimes we'll get these, um, these pops artists whose whose music is just uh, really old and, and kind of falling apart. So uh, that will often involve a lot of work for the librarian to try to make those, um, those parts acceptable for our players. Um, then other things that are pretty memorable are things that, that take a lot of um, time from the librarian that maybe the audience wouldn't necessarily realize. So we did a program a couple years ago called Around the World in 80 Days. Uh, for it was a family program, and uh, it actually consisted of 20 different excerpts from different pieces, which was a lot of work for for the libra library. So um, the fact that that came off, and there, were, there was only one rehearsal and a concert in the same day, so there's not a lot of time to fix something if something was to go wrong. So the the fact that that concert went off successfully with all the 20 different excerpts, which had different cuts and Different, um, different things to write in. Uh, I, I will remember that for a while, <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess uh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask uh, the question I've been asking everybody here. Do you have a favorite barbecue joint here in Kansas City? Yeah, Joe's Kansas City is probably my favorite. And then Arthur Bryant's, because it's really close to me. So I, I like to go there as well. First vote for Bryant's, look at that. Well, again, Fabrice, it's really been fun having you talk with me today. Uh, our audience may not see you on stage as much as your colleagues, uh, but now at least they know you're as much a part of the action, if not more uh, than they are. And certainly I know every bit as critical. Uh, so thank you for being a great addition to the Kansas City Symphony family. And uh, I hope we can get back to Boeing and ordering music very soon. Um, before we sign off, if I remember correctly, you speak a little bit of German. I wondered if you wanted to say a goodbye message in German. Uh, vielen Dank fürs Zuschauen. Ich hoffe, wir sehen uns bald bei einem Konzert. Musik